Welcome to this special Gastro Girl podcast. This episode was produced in collaboration with the American College of Gastroenterology's Patient Care Committee. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gollin. Well, hello, gastro groupies. Today, we're delving into a sensitive but important health topic, obesity. And I always wonder what comes first, obesity or a GI health condition. And here, we're going to explore the link today. So it's no surprise that obesity has become pandemic. With an estimated more than 650 million adults, that's 13% worldwide, suffering from obesity. In the United States, the prevalence is even higher, with 42.4% of adults meeting criteria for obesity. Wow. Now, today, we are so fortunate to have a leading endoscopist and obesity expert, Dr. Cy Gerapino, who co-authored an obesity primer for the practicing gastroenterologist, which was recently published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology. Dr. Gerapino is an advanced endoscopist and bariatric endoscopist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, where she also serves as the Director of Bariatric Endoscopy Fellowship and Associate Director of Bariatric Endoscopy. So welcome, Dr. Gerapino. Thank you so much, Jackie, for having me here, and thank you for the kind introduction. Oh, we're so grateful. We're so happy to have you. You've done an amazing job with that article that was in the American Journal of Gastroenterology. And I know that it was geared essentially for gastroenterologists, but we really thought it was so important to bring some of that knowledge and that learning to the patient audience. Uh, So that's why we had you on today. Thank you. We're very proud and we're very excited. We were so happy writing that article. So thank you. So as before we dive into some of the uh, the points in your article. Can you give us, you know, for all intents and purposes, what is the definition of obesity? Who's classified as obese according to the definition of obesity? Yeah, thanks for asking, Jackie. So the definition of obesity is when patients have a BMI or body mass index of greater than 30. And to calculate the BMI, you use your weight in kilograms um, divided by your height in meters squared. Um, So anything above 30 is classified as quote unquote obesity uh, for the Western countries. Wow. So with that said, how How bad is the obesity pandemic? I know when you actually do the math, it's actually not uncommon at all. And like you said earlier, right now, uh, the prevalence of obesity in the U.S. is about 40%. And believe it or not, they predict that by 2030, so nine years from now, half of the U.S. population will meet this criteria for obesity. So it is a major problem. That is huge. It's really scary out there. And I'm sure this pandemic that we've had COVID hasn't helped. Uh, Not at all. Not helping at all. Oh, goodness. So this is an interesting question. And logically, we know that obesity can really affect our health in many ways. But today, we're really going to focus on how it affects uh, the link between uh, GI conditions, between obesity and GI conditions. And what is the cause and effect, right? Does obesity cause us to have worsening GI symptoms or do our GI symptoms or conditions, does that cause any of our obesity issues? So what makes some sense of this for us? What we know is that obesity is associated or related to many, many diseases and several of which are actually GI conditions. And Dr. Camilleri actually did a wonderful job. He had a really nice review article where he just talked about obesity and any GI diseases. So for example, we know that obesity increases the risk of acid reflux. It increases the risk of colon cancer, and it can come in several ways. When patients have obesity, it either increases the incidence of those GI conditions, or maybe patients will present earlier, or maybe they present in a more severe form of those GI conditions. So depending on which disease it is. That's an interesting point, And it's a very important point. With that said, what are some of the most common obesity related GI conditions? Yeah. So I think that's a really good question. Like in day-to-day basis, uh, the big ones that people think of are number one, acid reflux, very common disease. And we know that when you look at patients who have obesity, the risk of acid reflux is twice of that of patients with normal weight. Another big one is fatty liver. 
if you look at patients who meet the criteria of obesity, 90% of them have fatty liver. They may or may not know that they have fatty liver, but actually it's about 90%. However, if you look at normal population with a normal weight, the incidence of fatty liver is only 25%. So I wanna say those two are probably the most common GI related diseases that, that are strongly associated with obesity. Yeah, that's, we just did a, a really great podcast with Dr. Quo yeah. um, on fatty liver. And he made the, this really, and we talked about alcoholic liver disease as well. Um, and he also made a connection between what's happened with the pandemic and people having more uh, time at home, eating bad food, not exercising. What happens to a patient's health when their liver is not functioning properly, right? Many, many years ago, it used to be that alcohol is the major problem or major cause of chronic liver disease. But now people know that alcohol is bad. So now it turns into non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFOD. And now this is the number one cause of chronic liver disease worldwide. And it's strongly associated with obesity. And we know that when people have extra weight. Uh, what happens in your body is that fat goes to the liver. So you start having quote unquote fatty liver where you have extra fat. And with time, those fat can cause an inflammation inside your liver. So now you become, um, you have something called NASH, which stands for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So that's the next step when your liver starts having an inflammation. And then with time, many, many years, people start developing something called cirrhosis, uh, which is when you start having scarring inside the liver. And that's definitely not a good thing you want to have. So that's why it's very, very important to diagnose obesity or fatty liver early on so that you can work aggressively and try to help your patients lose weight before it becomes quote unquote too late when your patients start having cirrhosis. So can you have cirrhosis? We always think of alcohol. Can you have cirrhosis of the liver without alcohol being a factor just by the fact that you're obese? Is that true? Yeah, yeah, definitely true. Like you can have cirrhosis from alcohol or you can have cirrhosis from NASH, uh, which is non-alcohol causes. So we really need to get it right. The society needs to get it right and pay attention to the liver. And mm -hmm. that's why we're talking today because we don't want to have obesity, um, get out of control and damage uh, people's livers any more than they already have. Right. I mean, this is like oh, a serious no, like, issue, serious issue that go hand in hand, like obesity and comes with many, many other problems. And fatty liver is the next thing that we're going to start seeing more and more. And, you know, like when you talk to patients in clinic, when you say like, Hey, you know, we want to help you lose weight from 250 pounds to 200 pounds. But also when you translate them into the liver and say like, Hey, look at this, liver ultrasound, looking at your liver numbers, you see some damage, you see some sign of damage inside your liver, then usually patients start to, to be like, oh, you know what? I have to take this weight seriously because I want to protect my liver. Yeah. And I know we're on the liver, but I'm going to ask this question. Like, what are some of the, you know, someone knows they're overweight, someone, you know, they may not be sure if they have liver damage. What are some of the early signs that you may notice is your hair affected, is your nails affected? Like what, maybe you have some pain, like what, what would be some of the early signs? That's a really great question. There's no real early sign for fatty liver. Usually by the time you see the sign, it's already late. Oh, wow. So that's why it's so important uh, for all gastroenterologists or even PCPs to think about this connection. When you see patients, if their BMI is greater than 30, you can get something called a uh, transient elastography, which is a fancy ultrasound of the liver. And it can tell you um, how much fat is in the liver and also how much scarring is in the liver. Very non-invasive. It's just an ultrasound, five minute test. Do that thing quickly. And then you can and tell the patients, hey, you have maybe great two fatty liver. And sometimes you might not even see anything on physical exam. If you check blood, um, like um, check labs uh, in patients' blood, you might not even see any abnormalities, but it's really happening. So you want to think about it and get an ultrasound. That's great advice. So I'm going to get back to that because I want to ask if you can reverse some of that. But let's talk about 
How do GI healthcare providers evaluate patients for obesity? Could you briefly explain those key elements? Yeah, so I think you can break it down into if you um, are specializing in obesity or not, but standard evaluation for every GI providers, I think include number one, from a medical standpoint, you wanna do a thorough physical exam. You can look at the patient's neck. Uh, sometimes if you see dark skin around the neck, that is an early sign of insulin resistance. Oh. Or you might wanna check some basic blood work when you see your patients that have a BMI greater than 30, check for TSH, make sure they don't have hypothyroid. Uh, because when people have hypothyroid, they tend to gain weight. You also want to check liver enzymes, make sure they don't have abnormal or ele elevated liver enzymes, which might indicate that there is some injury to the liver. And then moving on to the next category, which is lifestyle evaluation. Basic questions, you want to ask patients about what they eat, do a diet history. The easy one is to um, do a 24-hour diet recall. Um, so usually I ask patients to say, hey, yesterday, which is Monday, uh, what exactly did you eat since you woke up? Breakfast? snack, lunch, and then go through until they went to bed. And then you can kind of evaluate how many calories, uh, what macronutrients your patients tend to eat. So you can identify what problems or what you can work on with your patients. And then another important element is physical activity. Oh. So you can ask your patients, hey, are you using Fitbit? How many steps do you walk per day? Do you go to the gym? How many minutes? And when you go, what do you do? Do you do cardio? Do you do resistance workout? Uh, because the guidelines say you want to exercise at least 150 minutes per week. And out of those, at least two sessions actually should be a resistance workout. So not all cardio. So basic stuff like that, you can start having that conversation with your patients. And then the next eval is usually um, you're going into psych eval, um, but usually I start something like at a bigger level, try to see if your patients might have an eating disorder, uh, binging disorder, stress eating. Um, so you can ask them like, hey, what do you think is a component that contribute to you gaining weight? If you start being suspicious that there might be some eating disorder, there's a questionnaire that I usually use in the clinic with my patients as well. That is so important. And I'm so glad you brought that up because it's been a really hard journey for many of us over the last year with uh, the pandemic of COVID. And I'm curious, and I'm sure our listeners are too, when you're asking your patients, and it's embarrassing to even admit that we've eaten that bucket of uh, chicken wings or a bag of chips. And, you know, what are you seeing? And, you know, we're making light of it, but it's a really serious issue. And, it's not about being judgmental. And I want patients to feel like it's really important when doctors like yourself ask these questions to be completely honest with the physician. Mm -hmm. So what are you seeing? Are you seeing any similarities in what people's diets have been? Have they been all over the place? Have they not been eating enough? Have they been eating too much of the wrong thing? Like what, what do you see as any trends that that you, you've seen recently? Yeah. I want to say like during the quarantine for the past year, it's definitely have been very hard for a lot of our patients. Um, more patients uh, tend to have worse eating habits. Uh, most of them say, hey, my kitchen is here. And then they would just turn the camera to their kitchen and they're like easy access, you know? So it has become hard. I want to say 25% of my patients who, who got the procedure with me are very motivated and they're they stay on track, uh, but more, I want to say more patients actually have a hard time uh, with the eating um, schedule. So are you seeing them eating more junk food, more processed food, not enough vegetables, like what you would assume is happening yeah. is happening? Yeah, that, and also like we get more and more consults coming in. I want to say like halfway through the pandemic because they start to realize like, oh my God, uh, I have been eating worse uh, for the past six months during the quarantine. So I think I need to do something. So we definitely see a higher number um, in new consultations for, for weight loss. And that's such a great segue to our next question. So now that we've set the stage, which is a little bit kind of doom and gloom, it seems really depressing. And, <laughs> you know, you know, you care about the people, you care about your patients, I care about the patients. What can we do about it? And I know there's so many options. You, you mentioned briefly the procedure. I know we have different schools of thought, you know, there's the dietary interventions, and we don't 
you know, we have, we work with dietitians who bring to light very important factors, like not making it about weight. It's a weight neutral approach to, to being healthy and, and eating a good diet. You don't necessarily have to be a certain weight that you're shooting for. It's really about those other factors, right? If your liver is happy, if you're, you know, you're not having the symptoms of GERD so much, that's more important, right? Than a particular number on a scale, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Usually um, when I meet with my patients for the first time, after we do a very thorough history, then I start doing my spiel where I said, um, usually when you think about how to lose weight, we can divide the treatment into four categories. So the first one is lifestyle intervention. So eating healthier, exercise more. Um, so that's first option. Second option is pharmacotherapy or weight loss medications. And right now in the US, we have five medications that are approved specifically for weight loss. And then I move on to the third category, which is bariatric endoscopy, where we perform a procedure through the mouth, no scar to help patients lose weight. And then the last category is bariatric surgery or the traditional weight loss surgery. So I kind of go over big picture, the four categories. And then after that, I say, hey, based on your BMI today, these are the two or three options that are available for you. The easy one is for bariatric surgery in the US, right now the, the uh, criteria for the insurance to approve and pay for bariatric surgery is that you need to have a BMI greater than 40 or greater than 35 with at least one obesity related comorbidity like diabetes, fatty liver. So some patients who come to me might not meet that criteria. So then we say, hey, you know what? Even though you, we know we want to work on losing some weight, at least good thing is you're not, you're, you're too small to get bariatric surgery. So we're going to talk about the rest. And then after that, we spend more time trying to delve down into each of them and then try to pick which one might be best for the patient. So are there certain, I'm sure there are guidelines. So if someone is sitting at home listening to this wonderful um, information from you, you know, where, where do we start? Do you try to do the least invasive things first? Like, is there, you try the diet and lifestyle intervention, or if someone's just been, I've been trying to lose weight for years, I've been going to the gym every week. They, they really can't move the needle on, you know, feeling better. And they're still have a very high BMI. How does that work? Yeah. So to me, I, I don't think there's a hard rule in terms of like what sequence we should go through, but lifestyle is very important. So if, we detect pretty early on during the conversation that they're still eating poorly uh, and there's a lot of room for improvement, then I would work on that part first. And um, in our center, we have a bariatric diet, bariatric endoscopy dietitian who works for two bariatric endoscopists. So that will be the first person I will send the patients to. If I figure out that the patients might have some stress eating, emotional eating, binge eating, then we have a bariatric psychologist, um, Dr. Paul Davidson, who I would refer the patients to first. So that would be the first part for the lifestyle. But like you said, Jackie, a lot of patients actually are very good, very disciplined. They eat very healthily. They exercise, go to the gym five times a day. Oh, sorry, five times a week. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. That's a lot of exercising. Um, <laughs> and they still cannot lose weight, you know, like it's, it's not easy. Um, then, then you can say, hey, congratulate, congratulations. You work really hard on lifestyle. I think we need to focus on other methods and try to augment the amount of weight loss. Then usually between the big decision I want to say is between doing medication first or offering bariatric endoscopy procedure first. So right now in the U.S. for pharmacotherapy or weight loss medications, the indication uh, for starting patients on medications is BMI greater than 30 or greater than 27 with at least one comorbidity. So kind of like 27, 30. So if it's 27 to 30, that's easy. Then you do medication first. Then you have another category of patients whose BMI is somewhere between 30 to 40, where they do not qualify for bariatric surgery. They try and fail lifestyle intervention. So now the category, the possible options are medications or endoscopy. 
then I will spend more time explaining pros and cons of medications and also bariatric endoscopy that I do for them. And I do both. Um, and I want to say maybe 60, 70% of my patients pick bariatric endoscopy first, and then 30 to 40% will say, hey, let's try medication first. I will come back to see you in three months, and then we can swap. Interesting. And so I know years ago, I remember reading news articles and things about the, uh, some of the weight loss medications weren't very safe. Are we seeing better, better uh, products, better therapeutics that are more, uh, that are safer for patients? Definitely. I, I think a lot of patients still remember FenFen, uh, okay. which is from like uh, I want to say 20 years ago, uh, where they have like cardiac side effects. So that medication is now off the market. Um, so right now we have five medications, relatively safe, but I always advise the patients of the benefit, which is about 5% weight loss. So if they come in 200 pounds, I say, okay, if we start you on medications, you can expect about five, if you're lucky, maybe 8% weight loss uh, at one year. Um, and then these are the side effects of all these five medications. And usually which medication I start first, depending on what other health problems they have and what other medications they are on, because sometimes you have drug drug interaction. Is it uh, appetite suppressant? Is it something like a antidepressant that kind of what I'm curious, like, what is the mechanism that it addresses? You know, it's not just I suddenly love, just melt, melt fat. It's like, what is it? How does it work? Yeah, I love those mechanism questions. So it depends, okay. uh, depends on which medication. So the basic one is like orally stat. So that one, it basically like um, absorbs oil or fat uh, and remove fat from the GI tract. Uh, some of them suppresses appetite. Like you said, Jackie, like it works in the brain and suppress your appetite. So my patient would come in and say like, hey, I don't feel hungry at all. I forget to eat. And some medications like the newer one, GLP-1 agonist or a Saxenda, Liraglita, you might have uh, heard it on the commercial. That one is an injection and it's a GLP-1 agonist. So it helps improve insulin resistance. And it also makes you... Um, have early satiation. That's interesting. I love I love the mechanism questions too. I always like to figure out yeah. how drugs work in the body, what it how it what it affects and it's fascinating stuff. But do you have um some tips for patients on how you know this is very interesting and we all care about our health and we all want to look our best. What what are some of your recommendations to our listeners today that are listening and they they want to make a change? They, they know they need to do something. What, what is your recommendation for a first step? Maybe they have a GI condition. Maybe they have IBD or they have GERD and they're, they haven't been feeling well. Like, what, what are your recommendations? Um, I think one recommendation is that we is strongly associated with a lot of GI conditions. Uh, some of them might not be well known, uh, but usually... Uh, when you lose weight, it helps with a lot of conditions. So it's never too early and never too late to start working on getting some weight loss. And you might not need a lot. Like you might need to lose only 5% to start feeling a little better or start seeing some effects on your high blood pressure. Just lose 5%. If you want to see some improvement in your fat and liver, studies show that you need to lose 7 to 10% of your weight. So start early and you want, you get benefit not only like with, like you said, like see the number or your weight coming right. down, but you start seeing other health benefit to your body as well. Yeah, I think that's, that's another important point, because sometimes when we were in a rut, and myself, I'm guilty of this. But once I start getting out of that rut, I make better choices, I'm eating more consistently, you know, when I'm not starving myself all day, and then eating something, you know, late at night, like I shouldn't eat like pasta or spaghetti or something like that. I want to talk a little bit about, I love this term, and we've, we've had it before on some of our podcast is that shared decision making, you know, yeah. patients, you know, what can they, what can they bring to their doctor's office and not just Googling any old thing, but you know, how can they arm themselves with the best information, the best questions for when they're talking to their doctor, whether it's a GI doctor, what, what should they be asking their doctor about? Like, what would you, what would you suggest? So the most common question or the most common scenario when, when I see my patients in my weight loss clinic is that I want to lose weight, but more often or not, they, 
they're not sure what should be the next route or what the options are. So, so usually number one, you, you want to learn as much as you can during the first visit with your doctors. And in addition to lifestyle intervention, medications, bariatric surgery, bariatric endoscopy is actually another approach um, to treat patients with obesity. And a lot of patients actually do not know about bariatric endoscopy option. So I would spend time explaining what bariatric endoscopy is to my patients and what procedures we can offer and also how much weight loss they get. And it ranges from 10 to 25% weight loss with bariatric endoscopy. So I have a PowerPoint presentation for my patients. So, and then usually I will, we have a website. So then we'll send the website, we give the website to the patient. They go home, watch the video a little more, learn a little more, and then ask more questions. So don't rush into making any decision during the first consultation. Learn as much as you can about all the options. There's no right or wrong answer. Usually it comes to, do I want to start medication first, or do you want to go right to something that gives me more weight loss? So, so let's talk a little bit about this. And I know we're going to get into a really awesome webinar with some of your peers, and we're going to really talk about a multidisciplinary approach to obesity management and weight loss in a healthy way. And so I can't wait for that. That's coming. You're going to record that in June and it'll probably be released in uh, July. We're super excited about that. Me too. Um, I can't I wait. Forward to it. I know we're going to get a whole, we're going to get all the different pieces of of what you just said, we're going to get the lifestyle piece, we're going to get the GI psychologist piece. But but let's talk about your expertise. I mean, we would be stupid not to talk to you about bariatric endoscopy and how that would work if, if a patient came and you, got, you guys decided to go down that route. Like, what, mm -hmm. what does it entail? And I know there's a lot of things mm -hmm. that people may not think about. There's a whole team that that is involved when you have that type of procedure. So just Clue us into what, what this is involving. Sure. So a little highlight on bariatric endoscopy. Um, usually the target population uh, is for patients with a BMI between 30 and 40. That is ideal because you want to lose weight. Usually you try everything, you know, like you try Atkins diet, you try Weight Watchers, you lose some weight and then you gain weight. So you try, but you're too small to get bariatric surgery. And that's why bariatric endoscopy is perfect for you. So usually what I tell my patient is that number one is not surgery, it's an endoscopy. So you won't have any scar on your belly. Uh, we pass a scope into your mouth and we do some fancy procedure to help you lose weight. And then these are all outpatient procedures. So you come in the morning, I finish the case in about one to two hours, and then you go home the same day. Okay, Dr. Gerpino, you're not going to get away with saying some fancy procedure. Like <laughs> inquiring wine, minds want to know, what is what do you do when you go down there? <laughs> all right, so now we're going to go into what is this fancy procedure? So, yeah. <laughs> so right now in the U.S., we have three um, big ways or big three different procedures that we can do uh, via endoscopy to help you lose weight. Number one um, is intragastric balloon. So what it is, is that I go into your mouth and then we put a silicone balloon and then put in normal saline with a little bit of methylene blue. And depending on your height, I put in about 550 cc to about 700 cc of fluid so that the balloon is sitting in your stomach. Right now in the US, the balloon is approved for six months. So we'll meet every month or so to make sure you, your weight is coming down. But then at six months, they have to do a second endoscopy to remove that balloon. Oh, wow. And overall, I, I usually say the amount of weight loss you can expect with a balloon is about 10% of your starting weight. So if you're 200, you can expect about 20 pound weight loss uh, with a balloon. So that's the first category. The second category is called an endoscopic sleeve procedure. So this is kind of like a, a sister version of the surgical sleeve, uh, but we do it through the mouth instead. I go into your mouth and then I use either a suturing device or an endoscopic stapling device to reduce the volume of your stomach. 
And basically I said, imagine if your stomach um, is starting out with a football size. After the procedure, it becomes a banana size. So it's reduced by about two thirds of the volume. And what we think how it works is that uh, food systems in your stomach longer. So you feel full for a longer period of time. And then you eat a little bit less and you feel full sooner. So that's kind of like a, an easy way to understand how you lose weight with the endoscopic procedure. And depending on the device, uh, patients tend to lose somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of their starting weight. I do have several super responders um, who get up to 30 percent of their initial weight with this procedure. So that is the second category. And then the third endoscopic category that we also offer is called aspiration therapy. So what it is, is that I go into your mouth and then I put a, it's a peg tube um, or like a feeding tube kind of uh, that connects your stomach to the skin. And then it has a button on it oh, wow. so that about half an hour after you have lunch and half an hour after you have dinner, you go to the bathroom, open that button and then connect that tube to a longer tube and then aspirate about a third of the food that you just ate out. So your body ends up absorbing less food. Oh my and goodness. And people lose about 20% of their starting with, with this procedure. That must be for the most seriously overweight patients, correct? Oh, you got it. So this device actually is approved for patients with a BMI of 35 up to 55. So yeah, so the indication is higher. That sounds really serious. I mean, so the goal, so with the balloon, it's more temporary and the sleeve is long term. So you're always going to have that banana sized stomach. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, so we have data, um, Dr. Reen Sharai from Cornell uh, published her data up to five years uh, for an endoscopic sleeve, and she showed that the amount of weight loss stayed at five years, and we have several patients who are five years out, and, and they're still at their uh, about 15% weight loss. And correct me if I'm wrong, there are programs or coaching programs, I don't know how you would call it, but, but you don't just, okay, I'm going to have this balloon in my body and my stomach and okay, bye, good luck. Come back in six months. You have nutritionists, right? You yeah. have psychologists. It's a whole team approach because oh my God, yes. it's behavioral, right? You, you get used to eating less. It probably helps you really get tuned into what you're eating and more mindful, make better choices because you can't fit that much stuff in. You want to make sure that you're getting the proper nutrition, right? Totally, totally. We have an amazing team here and I encourage all GI physicians who want to start bariatric endoscopy program to also pay attention to starting a really good um, multidisciplinary program. For us, we have Catherine, um, who's our bariatric endoscopy dietitian. And then we also have a PA physician assistant who kind of call and make sure patients are doing okay. So for our program, after you get a procedure with us, you get 12 visits after the procedure for the first year. And that breaks down to a few uh, visits with me, uh, multiple visits with a dietitian, some with a PA. So basically you have like a point of contact almost every month with one of us to make sure that you're eating healthily, you're adapting your lifestyle to a healthier lifestyle to maintain, to make sure that you sustain that weight loss. This has been so insightful. And again, like we can't wait for your upcoming educational webinar with your peers. We'll have Dr. Austin Chang moderating the panel. We'll have Beth Rosen, our amazing dietitian. We'll have uh, Dr. Megan Real, uh, the GI psychologist. This is going to be a powerhouse recording a webinar. It's going to be so fun. It's going to be so fun. So we're going to delve into all the different aspects of uh, obesity and how you can manage it and lose weight and just feel feel better. We don't want to have patients that are suffering with GERD or more IBD uh, flare ups because of their obesity issues, right? We want to help people feel totally, better. Totally, totally. And, and one amazing thing about this view is that it's not only just a number, like you said, like when you see them like a year, I just saw one who's like two years uh, after I did the procedure. It's not just the weight loss, but we check their like liver labs, for example, and her liver numbers went from 60 before the procedure to 16. And we know that there's something good happening in her liver. It's just not her like losing her pant size, but you're doing something good internally for your body. And, and you just see the happiness in your patient's eyes. So it's a That's really so great. You're, you're doing such a rewarding um, 
job every day. And it must feel so good to know you're making a difference in, uh, in patients' lives. And again, I'm going to bring it back to the liver because you can reverse those bad numbers, right? You can yeah. reverse those bad numbers. So classic teaching is that once you get to quote unquote cirrhosis or like severe scarring, it's hard to reverse. So anything before that, definitely. Good. Like if you do a fibro scan, for example, and you see that patient have like stage three fibrosis, definitely losing weight, 7%, 10% can reverse those scars. Once you get to the cirrhosis level, losing weight still helps delaying the progression of cirrhosis because when you have cirrhosis, you only become sicker and sicker. Um, so by losing weight, it helps. No, well, thanks for the empowered words. And in, in closing, if you could say one thing to our listeners today in hope and in positivity, uh, if someone's struggling with obesity right now, what's your, what's your best advice for them right now? So um, I think I'm going to bring it back to statistics. So you see that almost half of the U U.S. adult population meet the criteria for obesity. So you're not alone. If you feel like you're struggling with weight loss, a lot of people are as well. And, and everyone's trying hard. So it's not embarrassing to bring that up to your healthcare providers. Just be honest. Just be open. Like, hey, I want to lose 10 pounds. And I've been trying, but it doesn't work. Like, what should I do? And then you usually is getting more and more common at most hospitals now where they have obesity medicine experts. Um, so you can be referred to a weight loss clinic and start getting hooked up to those clinic and start working on it more seriously. And so much better than just going on Google and trying to find the latest uh, supplement or there, right. there's no quick fix, right? There's right. no quick Diet fix. pills, all those, just get into the official program. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Girapino. I can't, I can't wait to have you on uh, again. And this has been so informative. Uh, thank you so very much. You're welcome. And thanks so much for having me, Jackie. I look forward to the next session. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.